Our first scripture reading is from Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. You can follow along your pew Bible, page 85, regardless, hear what the Spirit says to you today. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is found in 1 Thessalonians, the third chapter, verses 9 through 13. You can follow along in your pew Bible on page 204, or just hear what the Spirit says to you today. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that you, that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way, decrease myself and increase the God in me so that everyone by the sound of my voice knows that they heard a direct message from you my rock and my redeemer, In Jesus name, amen. I, well, since this is my first time being here to fellowship with you, um, Bruce put me on the spot reading my bio, said that he was looking forward to a personal story. I love telling stories. I just don't have one in my sermon this time, <laughs> but maybe the Holy Spirit will have her way and um, give me a story that um, I can tell you on the fly. But a little bit about me. I am a ruling elder at Faith Presbyterian Church um, in Southwest DC. Um, what else would you like to know? I've been Presbyterian now going on 12 years. I did not grow up Presbyterian. I grew up United Methodist. I became Presbyterian through marriage. I am no longer married, but I'm still Presbyterian. So that says a lot. Um, 
And, you know, this text on this first day of Advent, and we lit the hope candle, and my sermon topic is uh, a hopeful homecoming. And just to set the stage, I'm going to go in real time um, because I love the Today Show. I grew up on the Today Show. My mother watched it every single morning. Jane Pauley and Bryant Gumbel were like my, my extra teachers, if you will. Okay, so they're now telling my age, right? And so, but in the month of November, they have been doing Home for the Holidays, kind of. I can't remember the title, so I went with a Lifetime movie title, right? Home for the Holidays. And um, what they were doing were highlighting homecomings because we've been in almost a two year pandemic and people were starting to travel and, um, and coming together for Thanksgiving, right? And they shared this one family who the sister, a very close knit family, the sister moves to um, um, Sydney, Australia, right before pandemic. And so she hadn't been home for almost, she hadn't seen her parents and her siblings since, um, when, you, when you think of it like this, I haven't seen my family since 2019 because the pandemic came so fast that a lot of people didn't, the last time they went somewhere was in 2019, right? I was recently, one of my uh, jobs as a ruling, um, as a vice moderator for your presbytery is to do installations. And so we did an installation for um, an associate pastor in our presbytery about two weeks ago. And it was so good to see colleagues that I haven't seen since 2019, right? And it felt good. It felt like coming home for the holidays. And so the text that, we just, that I just read and lifted up for you found in 1 Thessalonians reminds us of what it feels like to be anxious and worried about the people that you love, right? And let me give you a background story. So I'm gonna set the story up for you, Bruce. It's not my story, it is Paul's story, but it's a story nonetheless, right? And so we have to go back to Acts to really get the sense of why Paul is writing this letter with um, thanksgiving and praise and a little bit of worry. Now, you didn't hear the worry in chapter three, but if you start in verse in chapter one and two, there's a lot of anxiety with Paul, okay? So he, with Silas and Timothy, start this church in Thessalonia. I think I said it right, right? Uh, in this little small town, he starts this church, right? He's preaching and teaching for like three days, and the Jewish people are, you know, they are resonating with him in the word and they have now believed that Jesus was their Messiah and they, they begin to believe. Even some well-intended um, well Greek folk, some rich people that didn't even know um, uh, anything about Christ or anything about the Jewish faith, they converted as well. And so they start this church but then there are some other Jewish people that did not believe that Jesus had come. And they were a little pissed off, if I could say pissed in this church. But they were, because they started a riot. And in the middle of this little small town with this little church of faithful people, this riot breaks out. And they are coming for Paul and Silas. Not so much Timothy, but they were coming for the, the leaders of the church. And so the believers of the church tell him to go. Like they say, we got it, you can go because they didn't want their faithful pastor to, to, be, ex to be executed or to be beheaded or they were doing really bad things to Christians in this time and they didn't want anything bad to happen to their pastor. So they tell them to leave. And so while he was away, he's writing to the church because he felt like he left too soon. He did not equip them enough to be faithful in his absence. And so when we get to chapter three, he finds out from Timothy that all is good. Like the Thessalonians are faithful people that even in the trying times of that day, they are holding on to every word that Paul has taught them. They are in their Bible 
and they are remaining faithful for Paul's return. And so that's why I titled the sermon, A Hopeful Homecoming, because as we wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ, we need to be faithful that number one, he's going to come back and we have to be ready. We have to be ready, church, in a posture of this, this an anticipatory uh, homecoming with our Lord and Savior. And so even though um, this was just really hard, I, I want you to think about if you ever went off to college or if you sent off a kid to college, right? And that very first break, that very first, so I went, I grew up in upstate New York. I went to college all the way in Virginia. That's how I um, got to the DC area. And my very first Thanksgiving, I went back home to, uh, to Hancock, New York. And my grandmother was so excited to see me. Now, if you knew my grandmother, she wasn't really like the friendliest person. Like she doesn't, she didn't really show her emotion. But uh, when she said, um, I missed you, I, <laughs> she said, I missed you, you're messy. Cause I was, I was kind of a messy kid. So I never kept my room clean and everything. And so she had to remind me of the parts of me that she didn't like. But it's funny how when you miss someone so much, you even miss the things that drive you the most crazy, right? So she did not like the fact that I didn't clean my room all the time or I had to, um, I had to be told to do things, but she really missed me. And the homecoming, I can still, almost 30 years later, feel the hug that my grandmother gave me when I walked in the door of that uh, two days before Thanksgiving. And I'm pretty sure you have had that sentiment as well, when you longed for something and you finally get to come back home. Like what was your first feeling when you walked into this church that you call your home church after being on Zoom for 20 months? It felt good. And that is what this text reminds us of when we wait for Jesus Christ to return. And in the waiting, it's when we are supposed to be kind, show compassion, be faithful Christians. What does it mean to be faithful Christians? Well, we could take a look around us and see all of the, all of the unrest, all of the heaviness, all of the things that could divide us, right? And could test our faith. But, but our word says, that we just need the faith of a mustard seed. Now, I'm not a gardener, but I had to figure out, I had to find out for myself, like just how small a mustard seed was because I had heard this all throughout my childhood, right? All throughout my adulthood, the faith of a mustard seed. You can barely see a mustard seed if you put it in your hand. And God says, that's the, that's the amount of faith that you need. That's it. And God will take care of the rest, right? And the faith, the faith is not about what you don't know, right? It's about, it's not about what you know. Excuse me. It's about what you don't know. Believing in that the God that you serve is going to handle the unknown. And I know that that is a lot of pressure, especially for, you know, type A, type A personalities, especially for people who have checklists, right? Because you want to know everything. I have, I have one of those. I have four children. My, my, my oldest daughter will not move unless she knows A through Z. And when I say move, like she won't go, she needs to know like who she's going to talk to. <laughs> like she's go she needs to know every single thing. I remember one time when, um, I had a book that had just came out and I ship my own books. So I don't send people to Amazon. They come to my website and I ship them out. And I was going in like 50 million different directions. And I had like 27 books that needed to be shipped. And at the time, um, I, you don't know what you don't know. I didn't realize that I could set up an account to have the, the, the uh, post office come to my house and pick up the books. 
Didn't know this at the time, so I was taking it to the post office. Um, I had one kid that needed to get to track practice and another kid that needed to get to a, a, a wellness checkup. And so I asked my daughter if she could go to the post office for me. Well, she needed to know how, what was she supposed to say when she got there? How much was everything gonna cost? What did she have to do? Like, I mean, I had to write out a list. And even when, I, when she got to the post office, the one thing deviated from my list. I didn't know that they changed the rules. <laughs> I don't work for the post office, I wanted to say, right? But I had to understand that her mind works best when she has all the information. And I had to say, sometimes when you think like that, you don't allow the Holy Spirit to just come in and do what the Holy Spirit does, right? So faith is about letting go of a little control and giving, your, and giving the parts that you hold close to over to God and see what God will do with that. I used to be a, uh, when I was in corporate America, I had planned out my entire workplace trajectory. So I knew when I started this job in three years, I wanted a promotion. In five years, I wanted to leave the department. In seven years, that's how my mind worked. I was always looking for the next bigger and better opportunity. Well, when the, when the company went bankrupt, my plan, my little five-year, 10-year plan went right out the door. And so sometimes we learn how to be more faithful and how to be trust and trust God more during times of the unknown, right? And so we don't know when Christ is coming back. But every year on this time, we light the candles of hope, peace, and joy. And then that last candle of love, which, is, which all equals all of that, hope plus love, hope plus joy, plus peace, equaling love, equaling the love of God in our lives. We don't know when, when the timing is going to come, but we need to be ready and we need to be faithful for we have this hopeful homecoming that is found in Christ Jesus. And we serve this living God that teaches us each and every day how to trust more, how to love more, how to hope more. And I have to tell you though, I would be remiss of me to sit here and tell you to be so hopeful and faithful and not share the times where I have been less of both. Because sometimes being hopeful is painful. And then I'm reminded of scripture that says, cast your cares upon me. I'm reminded of the Psalms that says, you know, the joy of the Lord is our strength. I'm reminded about this God that we serve, this Christ the King that we serve died on Calvary for our sins. There is hope in knowing that. There is hope in the sacrifices that Jesus has made for us. And so church, I just came by to take a minute to let you be reminded and steadfast in knowing that a hopeful homecoming is approaching. Be ready for his return. Amen.